Welcome to today's panel discussion, working with solder paste. Um, the solder paste is still the most effective interconnection medium uh, uh, for joining components, devices to the PCB, but it's also the most volatile material during assembly. So this panel is going to discuss some of the best practices uh, when using and handling solder paste. I'm joined by Keith Bryant from Keith Bryant Consultancy, uh, Chris Fredrickson from Insituare, and of course, Tony Lentz from FCT. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Keith, I'll start off with you on the end with the first question, and uh, that is what conditions can affect solder paste during transit and storage? Um, basically everything. <laughs> um, you know, um, most, most solder paste is at least shipped in a good, thick polystyrene um, system. Mm. Um, it needs to be kept at a... At a, at a um, a, a low standard even temperature it doesn't like temperature fluctuations and um, I had a situation a long long time ago where we had solder paste failing on a line for a, a large um, mobile phone manufacturer and we found out that the uh, paste had been left sitting on his dock for eight hours at a temperature of about 28, 30 degrees centigrade. Wow. So even with the polystyrene insulation and everything else, basically it was it was cooked before you started with it. Right. So right. yeah, you you really have to be yeah. you know, if, if it's if it's bad when it comes in, there ain't anything you're ever gonna do to make it better. Yeah, yeah. And it must be very difficult when you're when you're flying uh, solder paste that goes up into the, in the belly of an aircraft and it goes to these you know extreme minus degree uh, uh, situation and then get, has to come back to uh, a more normal yeah, I mean, temperature. All the, all the solder paste companies obviously do transporting tests, and yeah. they know that under the normal, you know, under normal situations with a bit of leeway, hmm. that you know everything will be fine. Right. Um, and they're, they're really careful how they ship it out. They try and ship it in the, the fastest way, and it's a track shipment and all the other things they need to. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, if you're buying it from a distributor, you've then got another link in the chain that, you yeah. know, those guys have to keep it in fridges and run a FIFO system and all the other stuff just to make sure that when it gets to the people who are using it, it's in the, the best shape that it can be in. Right, right. Chris, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, when it comes to shipping solder paste, there's... Um, it leaves the facility in, in great condition, mm -hmm. uh, but you never know what could happen there. So uh, when it comes to shipping um, in general as well, the, uh, our take, the, the best way to ensure that it is uh, fit for use is to make measurements mm -hmm. of it in receiving. So uh, when it comes to, to shipping, um, all the, the best practices are, are uh, great, but you never know what can happen when shipping. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's. Do, do these solder paste pots come with, you know, best before dates on them and stuff like that? And is there a, a system for every time the, the pot is opened and used uh, for it to be able to, to track how many times it's been exposed to air, for example? That's a great question. Uh, there is a an expiration date mm. on every lot mm. of solder paste. Yeah. And it, the amount of time that it's good on the shelf varies from paste to paste and from manufacturer to manufacturer. Yeah. But generally speaking, most of them have nine to 12 months shelf life. And when they get uh, closer to their end date, then their, the quality of the solder paste might also be affected. Mm -hmm. So if you have something that's late in its shelf life and you ship it and it gets elevated in temperature during shipping, mm -hmm. that could be enough to trigger it to where it's no longer going to be usable. Right. But in terms of opening it and using it and the number of times that it can be used over a period of time, mm -hmm. that really varies from paste to paste as well. And, a very, and it depends on the environmental conditions in which it's used. Yes. So if it's a very warm and humid environment in and around the printer, that's going to shorten the life of most solder pastes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. some solder pastes, will, like water solubles, will absorb moisture out of the air and become wet and soupy and difficult to print. Some no cleans do the opposite in that kind of condition. The elevated temperature causes reactions and moisture absorption also occurs in no cleans, but at a much slower rate. Yeah. And that can cause it to become tacky and more thick actually, and yeah. difficult to print because of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, best practice is to keep it within the recommended room temperature and, and conditions for temperature and humidity 
based on whatever the manufacturer's recommendations are. Right, yeah. right. Well, that kind of runs into my, what my second question was, which is what were the conditions that can affect soda paste during use uh, and, and what best practices can you, can you take? Is there anything you want to add to, to what yeah. Tony I said? Mean, um, first thing that you do is you don't use it until it gets up to room temperature. If you're taking a new pot out the fridge, you write the time and the date that you take it out of the fridge on the top of the pot, which mm -hmm. is a nice simple way of checking everything. Mm -hmm. um, if you're taking paste off a stencil, you have a, a clean empty pot that you can put it in. You don't mix it back in with the, the one that you have. And you know, you're, you're, you're exactly right. You know, um, Soda paste, if it's in a dry atmosphere, um, will lose effectively you know, flux, volatiles, and a whole load of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And if it's in a very humid atmosphere, it'll draw in water or whatever happens to be floating around in the environment at that time. Right. So yeah, it's you know, it's it's one of those things that if if you have a very you, you have good process control and good checking, mm -hmm. it's great. Right. But you know, if you have somebody who forgets to take a new pot out of the fridge and thinks, yeah, I'll just stir the hell out of it and then it'll be okay. Um, and suddenly you find out you've got loads of insufficiency and things all over the board because the paste, the, the rheology just isn't allowing it to roll like it's it should. Yeah. yeah, you know, we, we always say, and you know, every expert you ask has a different answer, but somewhere between 55 and 70% of the faults you find at the end of your production line happen right at the beginning, mm -hmm. and soda paste accounts for a large number of those in mm -hmm. some way, mm -hmm. shape, or form, whether it's paste that's dried out so it's sticking to the stencil, it's paste that's too wet so you've got either cold slump or hot slump further down your process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, it's, it's just a matter of good housekeeping and good process control. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point you make. I mean, Chris, I mean, you, your company's just brought a, a, a paste um, mixer. Uh, I mean, so how important is it to have real consistency there in, in, in that paste uh, before you apply it? Yeah, I think especially uh, early in the printing process, uh, having a, a good consistent mix can um, uh, improve the, the print quality there at that stage. And also, I think it, in general, it just goes towards the, uh, the approach where keeping, solder paste is a very dynamic material. Many different things can affect how it prints uh, whether that be the environment, how you prepare it, uh, and as many controls as you can add to that process, uh, the better you'll, you'll get a print. Right. Um, so having a, a very consistent mix each time is just one other technique that you can uh, utilize to keep the, the printing process as consistent as possible. Right, right. And also, I, I believe even you know, for the, the environment, you've got to watch where you've got air conditioning systems and things like that next to the printer or above the printer. Uh, because that can have an effect. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we we had um, one customer that was using the the Mark One, and uh, above they were having issues above um, in one of their lines, and it just so happened the humidifier for the facility was right above that one line, right. and you can pick up on uh, those those different sort of changes, and and in particular the environment and the humidity, airflow, all of that can have. Um, quite a big impact on performance that can be fairly difficult to, to track down. Yeah, 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 I believe so. Uh, so, Tony, what, what advice can the panel offer operators that are applying paste by hand? You know, when, when, when you're literally taking it out of the tub and putting it on the squeegee. Well, first of all, it's always good to shear thin the solder paste by mixing it mm. gently, you know, not excessively. Right. Or use some type of controlled mixing system to do that. Although not all solder paste respond well to that, in my experience, mm -hmm. uh, because operators tend to think, well, a little bit of mixing is good. Maybe more is better, right? Let's just <laughs> leave it in that mixer for a while. Um, and pastes have a like a hysteresis of viscosity. So if you mix it a little bit, you can achieve a nice working viscosity within just a 30 seconds or a minute of hand stirring. Mm -hmm. Or in a cartridge, as you're dispensing it from the cartridge, it's getting shear thin enough usually, it's just by going through the small opening of the cartridge tip. Yep. Um, but in the case of paste, maybe that are older solder paste, or they're using it for the third day in a row, and it's thickened a little bit over time, then you probably need to get that a little lower by mixing it for a longer period of time. And the viscosity will continue to drop mm -hmm. 
but then at some point the viscosity will recover and it'll re-thicken while you're using it. So you got to be careful with that. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. But it is best to mix it just to make it a nice working viscosity, mm -hmm. especially if there's any separation between the flux and the solder powder. Yeah. And you're going to want to make that more uniform and mix that back into the container. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so. Keith, does, does paste applied by a stencil printer versus a, a jetting system differ? And if so, how? Well, hugely because you need a, a different viscosity and a different rheology for working with jet dispense. And normally you need a smaller powder because of the way that you're dispensing it. So right. now we're printing either type 3 or type 4, and we're dispensing type, well, predominantly now type 5. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, you, you can't just take your normal soda paste out of a tub, fill it into a syringe, stick the syringe into a jet dispenser and think that it's going to work. Right. But obviously the other thing that you need to be aware of is that you need similar flux chemistries, you need similar, similar metal chemistries between what you're jetting and what you're printing so that you have a, a process that's under, under control and works as it should. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the danger is, and it's getting better now, but a, a lot of materials that you can buy, you can't buy a jet dispense equivalent. And you really need to have, you know, the same flux chemistry, the same melting point temperature, um, the same, obviously, the same materials yeah. within that. And as we're getting to low temperature solders now, where there's bismuth, there's silver, there's indium, there's a whole load of other stuff coming in, you need that, you know, similarity of chemistry it may not be exactly the same mm -hmm. you know and then we have a problem just if you want to talk low temperature solder to go off on a tangent yeah you know, it's very hard to get cord wire right. in low That's temperature true. solders because the the damn stuff is so brittle mm -hmm. and it 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 uh, o over time and time is only about like two three weeks after it's made um it starts to become more brittle because of what's happening with the bismuth inside it mm -hmm. so yeah, you know, we, we always say nothing solders better to solder than solder. But you just need to make sure that it's all the same stuff all the it's way all the through. Same stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess when 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 you're jetting, you've got the added advantage that it's in a, a cartridge, so it's in, it's it's in a uh, a vehicle. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, in a, it's in a great environment. It's the yeah. same as the you know the enclosed printing heads. Yeah. You know they keep everything pretty much under control in a way, mm. and everybody says yeah they're perfect. But the problem is you can't change what's going on inside the cartridge. Right. So if somebody's not taken it out of the fridge early enough, somebody's left a cartridge on there for a long time as opposed to putting it back in the fridge, maybe putting it into a spinner or something. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there's, there's variability everywhere, right. which is what, you know, as, as a consultant, we like. because keeps you in a job. <laughs> there, there, there's, there, there's lots of stuff that people can, I won't say do wrong, but maybe mm. just don't have under control as much as they'd like. Right. But yeah, it, you know, it is, it's a, a different animal, it's a different game. Mm -hmm. But it has its, its own problems with block nozzles and a whole load of other stuff. But you know, more and more people now, because we have really big components, we have really small components on the same board, yeah. are looking to you know, screen print and then jet where they need to put extra material. You know, a lot of printers now have actually got jet heads inside them for mm -hmm. doing exactly this. And also, um, you know, if you've got through-hole components and you want to reflow the whole thing with pin and paste, you need to get a lot of extra paste onto those pins because you've got to get fill through the, the length of the board the and if you've got 0201s, 01005s on there then you almost need no solder paste to get them to solder. So yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Chris, have you had any experience between the, the, the um, working with the, the, the jetting and the um, systems and uh, solder paste? Yeah, so uh, uh, we have done... Stencil printers, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have done a little bit of testing uh, with the jet solder paste and you do have um, because it's a, a much smaller uh, solder powder, uh, you can get more um, uh, exposure and, and influence in the environment if there's any delay mm -hmm. after um, printing. In, and in particular, I think uh, when it comes to the enclosed print head, I think I'll, I'll uh, parrot uh, what was said there in that uh, everything really does have to be perfect in that case. So we've seen with enclosed print heads where you get uh, a little bit of flux separation in that system and you'll get significant skips and insufficiencies throughout. Right. Uh, whereas 
a little bit of flux separation in a jar or cartridge uh, isn't much of a problem. So I think really having strong control over uh, all of the, the process does become um, doubly important in those cases. Is that, is that why enclosed print heads haven't really taken off to the level that we expected they would? I mean, you know, they, they, they came out a long time ago, if you remember, with the deck ProFlow. Uh, and everybody thought this was going to be the, the game changer, you know, in, in the industry. But it never really got to the level uh, accepted in, in, in the field. Um, is that because of the, there, are, there were some issues with it? I don't recall there being any issues with it necessarily, but there was an added cost. Right. And right. I think the added cost was incentive enough where folks didn't want to pay the extra money and okay. they'd rather buy it in traditional containers. Right. right. Okay. And, and at the early days of the, uh, the enclosed heads, a lot of material wasn't available in Semcos. Mm -hmm. And you know, that stopped people from using it. Um, and I think, you know, I, I see enclosed heads quite a lot in high volume manufacturing plants in Asia where they're building the same thing day in and day out. Yeah. But I think if you're changing and you're changing stencil thickness, you've got step stencils and a whole load of other things, then mm -hmm. yeah, you have you have a few more challenges with the enclosed heads. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, if you can be doing the same thing all the time and you're doing a huge amount of it, then yeah, that tends to be where they right. where, where at, at least where I see people using them. The, yeah. the various that makes sense. heads that, that are makes out sense. there. Okay. So, Tony, in, in rework and repair, is it essential to use exactly the same sort of paste as the original board was assembled with? It's not essential. In fact, I would say it, that's kind of rarely done. Most rework and repair that I've seen is done with wire solder. Yeah. And they're using some, you know, sack, usually the same alloy, mm -hmm. but there's a different flux core in there than what's in the solder paste, obviously. Right. And usually there's a, a little bottle of unmarked liquid flux sitting mm -hmm. on the re rework bench, and you don't know what type of flux that is. And it's all getting intermingled with the, the solder paste flux. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think our customers are just hoping for good reliability out of that mixture without mm -hmm. really knowing. But if it works, it works, and they don't get returns, and they're, they're happy with it. Um, I think certain customers do standardize on one supplier. Right. And when they do that, they're looking for compatibility matrices of fluxes to make sure that the liquid, the cord wire, and the solder paste are all, you know, they'll play nicely together and they're not going to cause any electrochemical migration problems. Right. So right. that's the best practice. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think, you know, Keith, you run into some issues with um, in rework and repair when you're doing reworking um, low temperature boards, for example, you know, where, where a lot of the, the packages of the, the balls and the BGAs are all SAC 305, you know. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we, we, when we started, BGAs were um, balls with pure tin, and we were soldering them with tin lead. So yeah. the ball itself was never melting. So we've always had this coalescing problem within the, within the build-up. But, you know, um, I, I was at a presentation earlier this week and there was a guy who said, well, you know, what we really need to do is we need to take all the balls off, replace them with low temperature solder, and then everything will be fine. And somebody in the audience said, well, yeah, but it depends on the makeup of the low temperature solder. So now you're into a situation where you either have to reball BGAs with exactly the, the formulation of low temperature solder that you're using, or you have to try and buy a BGA that has a low temperature solder ball on, which is exactly the same. And you know, it's like everything, you're, you're reballing it, so you're putting it through effectively two more heat processes. And then you get into, okay, we're doing this for high reliability of the joint, but do we lose reliability of the component when we're continually doing this, well, and yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's always a um, it, it's always a difficult one. But I mean, rework, rework has always been something that you know, if you don't control it properly, it lets down your whole process. Yes, I mean, you know, we we had the the, the classic um, a few years ago with the uh, the little. To, uh, the little bottle of flux under the be under the best that wasn't labeled with anything, um, and it turned out to be an RMA, and it was really <laughs> aggressive, mm. and there was one component on the board that didn't solder very well because it was an old component, mm. and this little lady was dabbing all of the legs with RMA and then not cleaning it off afterwards, <laughs> because she just found this little bottle and it worked, so it actually went in the what they were building were IGBTs that went into wind farms. Right. And these things were failing on top of mountains or oh, in the, no. in, in the in middle the of the sea <laughs> simply because the 
Flux was getting active because, of course, it's a lovely environment. You've got heat, you've mm. got humidity, you've got changes in temperature. And, yeah, it just ate its way through the copper on the circuit board, the nearest piece it could find, which was a via hole. And then, of course, the via hole becomes open circuit. The whole thing dies. Yeah. And it was just somebody trying to make the board look nicer mm -hmm. because the joints didn't look very good because the legs on the component were old and they didn't solder very well. Right. Wow. Well, that's but, a, that's you a, that's know, it's... It, it's always these, you know, these dangers, and it's always what we talk about. It's you know, not only controlling the process, but you have to control the environment. You have to look at the rework. You have to look at the repair. You have to look at the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's an interesting story for sure. Um, so, Chris, uh, anything to add on the, on the rework and repair uh, side? Um, you know, yeah. where I asked is, is it essential to use the same paste uh, as the original board was assembled with? Yeah, I think um, in, in general also the uh, most important thing is to uh, prevent rework in the first thing. Mm. Uh, so being able to have good enough control over your process to avoid that in the first place is going to have the, the best impact on overall reliability. Of course, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that makes sense. Okay, so moving on, final question. Uh, Sort of paste requires heat that potentially reduces reliability on some components on the board. Does the panel think it might be replaced one day with an alternative interconnection system? Yes. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, ultimately, you know, we, we're already working with some things that are taking silver-loaded epoxy. Um, mm. a, the semiconductor industry, they're using a lot of these things where... Um, when it cures, it actually shrinks, so it really does make quite a good connection between the component and the pad or whatever you're trying to work with. But at the moment, silver is so hugely expensive, expensive no yeah. one is going to do it. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people are struggling to solder 01005s. They, you know, we're, we're now looking at BGAs that have got 3,000 balls on them, and each ball is only about 30. 30 microns, mm -hmm. um, you know, solder paste is getting to the, the edge of its ability, ability to do stuff. And people are looking for better and better connections on these smaller things because in a lot of cases they want to transfer heat through them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you know, in, in the future there will be a new technology and I'm sure all the solder companies and all the advanced material companies are working on it. But it, it's, it's not out there yet in a reliable enough form that's cost effective enough to be an alternative. Okay. But it'll come. It'll come. Okay. You agree with that, Chris? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, there's a lot of different techniques that are, are being developed, materials that are being developed to support uh, alternative interconnect techniques. Um, I think it'll definitely take some time um, and we'll see it used in, in um, uh, more specialized use cases. Uh, but I, I'd agree with that take. Okay. Final word to you, Tony. Ooh, I get the final word. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, all I can say is I hope that the industry keeps using solder paste for a while because that will keep me employed for a while. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be around for a long time. But, you know, I'm sure as material science develops, there's going to be, there's going to be some uh, alternative will come along in the future. Yeah, certainly. Long after we were out of this industry. Oh, for sure. Yes. I mean, I, I can remember in the 80s when somebody told me through hole was dead because we've now got SMT. So, right. you know, uh, exactly. I, don't think, I don't think we need to worry within our lifetimes for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, I want to thank you for a wonderful uh, debate today. Uh, so uh, Keith Bryant from Keith Bryant Consultancy, Chris Fredrickson from Insituare, and Tony Lentz from FCT. So thank you, gentlemen, and uh, thank you to our audience for watching today. Expand your inspection capabilities. The Murtuk MV6 comes fitted with a best-in-class high-performance 18-megapixel camera. This provides inspection in five directions using top-down and four angled cameras simultaneously, finding defects that a single camera can't detect, such as OCR and QFN solder bridges.
Norton Electronic Solutions. Everything you need for precision automated fluid dispensing, conformal coating, plasma surface treatment, and selective soldering. Our passion is helping customers take their processes further, faster, with best in class technologies, dedicated global sales and support teams, and unmatched applications expertise. From the names you respect, Assam Tech Fluid Dispensing and Conformal Coating, March Plasma Treatment, and Select for Selective Soldering, we offer years of experience in advanced technology solutions for electronics manufacturing. Take your electronics assembly process further, faster. <laughs>